Hello, everyone. Welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. You are listening to the Financials Edition film today on Monday, July 25th, 2016. My name is Gabby LaPera, and joining me on the phone is one of our top analysts in the Financials Bureaus. Hello, John Maxfield. Hello, Gabby. I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Fantastic. I'm happy that you're here with us, too. Um, so, let's get right into it, folks. I think I might say that every week. I don't I don't think I do a lot of runaround ever, except for right now. Anyway, let's get right, in, right into it. Um, it's the end of the quarter, beginning of a new quarter. It's time to do bank earnings, because this is a financial show, and that's what we do. Um, generally, pretty great quarter for banks. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, if you so here's the thing. So if you look at it from a fundamental perspective, not an ama- not like a blowout quarter, right? I mean, it's not like these banks are reporting record earnings. However, when you think about what impacts stock prices, they did actually have a really good quarter. And so, what impacts stock prices are how a bank performs relative to analyst expectations. So if you just if we're just talking about let's say the the top six banks. All so that's J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. Five out of six of those banks per- turned in earnings per share that were better than what analysts expected. The one exception is Wells Fargo, which is kind of ironic because Wells Fargo, if you look look back at its you know historical quarterly performances, almost never misses expectations. But it came in at a uh, dollar one point oh one cents a share. Um, which is right where uh, analysts expected it to be. So it's not like it was a bad quarter, but not an amazing quarter. So I have a question for you. How do analysts come up with their expectations? That's a great question. So what they do is they have models that model for differences, you know, things that impact bank profitability, both the top and the bottom line. And then they just project those models into the future. Um, depending on you know what interest rates did over a quarter, you know whether there were legal settlements for a particular bank in a quarter, things like that. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that analysts can do and occasionally do is that they will modify their expectations for how they think a company will do in the middle of a quarter based on new information, which is part of the reason that banks did so well this quarter is because bank analysts decided that they should lower expectations mostly because of Brexit. That's exactly right. So if you go back over the past, say, three months, and you can kind of tr- you can see there's a lot of websites um, online that show the direction of analyst expectations and how they've kind of adjusted those. Basically, over the past three months, leading up to the end of the second quarter, analysts had consistently reduced their expectations for banks' profits um, on an earnings per share basis. And the reason is, you know, the principal reason was, you know, we had that Brexit vote on June 23rd. You know where the United Kingdom was trying to determine whether or not it wanted to separate from the European Union, which we've discussed on the show, and you know it obviously came out um, the the vote in favor of separating for the European Union. But even on top of that, and we saw this in the first quarter, you have concerns about moderating growth in China. You have concerns about what will happen to bank loan portfolios in the energy sector as a result of these low oil prices. So all of these things kind of cause the analysts to kind of back off their loan off their their earnings expectations for these banks. So it's one of those things where the bar was set low, but still good job to banks for doing better than expected. Yeah, and there's I mean and there's one other thing to keep in mind is that you know interest rates are still really low right now. Um, but banks were able to offset that, at least a handful of the banks were able to offset that with just very expansive loan growth. So let's take a you know let's think about J.P. Morgan Chase as an example. So J.P. Morgan Chase is the biggest bank in the country if you measure by assets. Well, on a year-over-year basis, J.P. Morgan Chase increased its loan portfolio by 100 billion dollars. Now, I know it's like you know like when you're talking about companies this size, it's easy to kind of lose track of how large some of these numbers are. But $100 billion is about the size of KeyBank, which is a major regional bank in the United States. So the fact that it grew that much, it really was able to offset um, some of the other headwinds in the industry. Yeah, I mean, and Wells Fargo was no slouch either, despite it being the only one that didn't beat analyst expectations. Part of that is that Wells Fargo is such a consistent performer that I'm sure I'm guessing anyway that analysts probably didn't lower their expectations as much for a Wells as they would, say, a Bank of America. Um, but Wells Fargo was up $80 billion in loan growth um, year over year, which is pretty impressive. That's really impressive. And you know, you actually bring up a really good point. So, you know, when you're thinking about banks and bank stocks in particular, there's really 
kind of two things that, that factor into the performance of an investment over time. The first is just the size you know, and just the, the magnitude of your profitability. So, you know, how high is your return on equity? How high is your return on assets? But you, the, it, what also matters, in, in fact, to an equal degree, is the consistency of your profit. So you don't want like a bank to have really, really high profitability, like you know, 20% return on equities like Bank of America, Citigroup had in 2005, 2006, and then give all of that back in a crisis or more some, well, or more than that. And so when you look at, you know, say Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, or banks like that that have done really well over time, it is a function of both. And let me throw M&T Bank in there too, a, a regional bank based out, in, uh, based out in Buffalo, New York, which is one of the best performing banks over the past three decades. What these banks have really nailed is not only a, very, a reasonably high profitability and return on equity, but also that consistency that you talked about with Wells Fargo. One day, I'm going to let you and Jay Jenkins just do a show on M&T Bank. It'll be just an ode to M&T. <laughs> it could go on. I could I could talk about M and T for for days. <laughs> I'm a big fan of them. It, you know, M and T Bank. It, now, I know this is kind of tangential because we're talking about earnings, but let's just talk about this now that we're here. M and T Bank oh, no. is <laughs> it is the it, it is the Warren Buffett. It is the Berkshire Hathaway of banks. So since it, its current chairman and CEO <laughs> took over in 1983, it's returned 18,000 percent, and that just blows not only most stocks out of the water. But a lot of banks out of the water, um, and and that it comes back to just growing responsibly, you know, returning, you know, generating a, a responsible return on equity, and just not giving that back each time the cycle turns around. I knew I shouldn't have started on M and T Bank. <laughs> it's your fault. It is. It is a hundred percent my fault. I take a hundred percent of the blame. Um, so let's talk a little bit about interest rates, a topic that is of perennial interest to us and one that we perennially, I don't say we get wrong because we always hedge our bets and say we don't really know what's going to happen, but eh. um, So interest rates are were lower than expected this quarter. Um, again, partially Brexit is to blame, but there's just been a lot of stuff going on um, with interest rates in general that would affect the Fed's decisions whether or not to raise interest rates. Um, one of that is one of those things is slow growth in China. There's that really bad jobs report in May, um, and also the the volatility in the energy sector. Those are all kind of contributing factors to why the Fed hasn't been raising interest rates like this. Kind of hinted that they would start doing back in December. Um, they did raise it once. They did raise it once, which is better than zero times. <laughs> so we'll give them credit for that. You know, here's the thing about banks. It, if you were going to boil down, you know, what really has a significant impact on their earnings, nothing is more important than interest rates. You know, even these big universal banks with both commercial banking operations and investment banking operations on Wall Street, even they generate about half of their income from interest income. So, and, and so what is that? That is, you know, going out, getting deposits, paying very, very little to borrow money from depositors, and then reinvesting that money in higher er interest earning assets, be it loans or some type of fixed income security. Well, if interest rates are really low, that's going to decrease or, or kind of hold down the amount of money that you're earning by reinvesting. Uh, those deposits into higher interest earning assets. And so that's why interest rates are so important. And, and to a point you've made, I mean, we are at just like this historically low point in interest rates. You know, they fell during the financial crisis when the Federal Reserve was trying to free up the credit markets. And, and because the economy just hasn't picked up the amount of steam that the Federal Reserve wants to see at this point, it just hasn't felt comfortable raising interest rates. And that's just creating these these these, these economic headwinds yeah. for banks in terms of earnings. And if you're a consumer, this is a great time to get a loan because your interest rates, if you have a fixed rate mortgage, are going to be super low. Um, but if you're a bank, it's not a great time for you, basically. And I, for most for most banks, this isn't the biggest deal in the world. It's just their profits are kind of stagnant. But for some banks, it's it's a lot bigger of a deal that interest rates aren't rising. Yeah, I mean, it's a big deal for for everybody, but it's a really big deal for some of these banks. And, and, and let's talk about one in particular. I mean, I, when I think about the banking sector, I mean, the story right now is what's going to happen with Bank of America. And, and, and this is why. I mean, so Bank of America, if you look at its profitability, so its return on equity, it hasn't generated enough, high enough return on equity since the crisis in all eight years since the crisis 
to exceed his cost of capital. So, so what does that mean? That basically means that Bank of America is out there getting money and has ca its shareholders' capital, and let's say it's paying 8%, that's what shareholders require it in terms of dividends or, or, or profitability or, or whatever it is, but then it's only earning, let's say, 6% on its equity. So it's actually destroying shareholder value. Well, one of the reasons it's destroying shareholder value is because interest rates are so low, so it's not in generating enough from its asset portfolio. But the other reason is that these re regulations passed since the financial crisis have really come down hard on large universal banks. So they have to hoard more capital. They have to hold more liquidity on their balance sheet. They have to do all these different things that, that weigh on their profitability. And Bank of America is in, in a, is in a situation where, unlike J.P. Morgan Chase, it's not number one on Wall Street. And unlike Wells Fargo, it's not number one on Main Street. So it's kind of playing second or third fiddle in both of its core markets. And that has impacts on its margins right because it's not getting the volume of business that its competitors are getting and because of that its its profitability has stayed low like this and if interest rates don't and and its ceo has even come out to say like look we are not going to be able to earn our cost of capital unless interest rates rise a little bit and so if and you know until that happens bank of america is in going to be in this precarious situation where shareholders are going to be saying like look at some point you guys have got to be earning your cost of capital and if interest rates stay low for let's say two decades like they have in japan their bank of america is going to have to make business decisions to tweak its business i.e get rid of its capital markets business its trading business that has such a big impact on its capital and liquidity requirements um, in order to 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 appease shareholders yeah, um, this is actually a, you're 100 percent correct. And the interest thing, like we said, is while it's not as big of a deal for say J.P. Morgan, um, it is ultimately going to affect their profitability a great deal. Banks have been pushing for a while now for interest rates to go up, but there's really no sign from the Fed when or if that will ever happen. <laughs> Um, speaking of which, the Fed uh, there's good news on stress tests for big banks. Yeah, I mean, the one thing to keep in mind is that while the banks are struggling right now from a profitability standpoint, so if you're looking at, and we're talking, we're talking more about their income statement, from a balance sheet perspective, they've actually, they're actually as safe as they have ever been, at least in modern memory. Um, and that's because, you know, if you look back at the stress test, these banks are just holding a, just an enormous amount of capital. So what the stress test does is it just, it makes these hypothetical economic it makes up these hypothetical economic scenarios and, and then tests to see what would happen to banks' businesses, and particularly their capital, basically how much money banks would lose under these economic scenarios. And in the most recent stress test, the results of which were re re released last month, the, it, this economic scenario was basically the same as the financial crisis in 2008 put together with the 2011 sovereign debt, uh, sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And then they kind of you know, looked at, you know, would banks survive this economic scenario? And if they would, what would be their capital positions after going through all you know, this hypothetical gauntlet? And even Bank of America, Citigroup, all of the big banks had literally tens of billions of dollars in excess capital above the regulatory minimums. Um, even after assuming they went through this, you know, this horrible economic gauntlet that the stress test presumes. So while, you know, to to your point, Gabby, while banks are struggling right now with this kind of stagnant revenue situation, there's just no question that they're as safe as they've been uh, in many, many decades. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I'd like to point out that the stress test tests for is having good internal controls and good risk management practices, um, which you obviously need in order to have all this capital on hand. Um, and all the big banks that we talk about regularly pass, so like JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Um, the the only example that comes to mind, I can't. There's one other bank that failed, and it was also on internal controls. It wasn't on capital and liquidity, but just on internal controls and like governance stuff. It was uh, Banco Santander, or if you're my mother, Banco Santander. You're welcome. I'm so sorry. I was pronouncing it with my horrible American accent. The last show, <laughs> um, and there was one other bank I can't remember, but neither of them failed because they lacked capital or liquidity. It was because of internal controls. Everyone else passed with flying colors on all fronts. Yeah, that other bank was Deutsche Bank, Deutsche and, and bank. if you think about kind of like Deutsche oh, man, Bank, that like, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the European banks are just in a world of hurt right now, giving everything that's going on. Deutsche but Bank yeah. has been in a world of hurt. Partially of its own doing for a while now, like pre Brexit, it was. It's just. It's not a pretty picture. Maybe. Maybe another show we'll talk about Deutsche Bank. <laughs> yeah. No, you're exactly right. I mean, like 
I mean, in fairness to Deutsche Bank, it's not in the same. It's not as bad as the Italian banks in terms of my understanding of what's going on over there. But I think they're all. It's trading for a quarter of book value, twenty five percent of book value, or in and around there is kind of what I read just recently, actually. And so you think like, whoa, like a quarter of book value. That's and, like September two thousand and eight. You know, what I mean, to put it in perspective over here. So for listeners who don't know, book value is basically how much the business is worth. So. Like people, like if you sold everything that was in Deutsche Bank, like you would get more than what you're actually paying for the stock. It's it's yeah, like, crazy. Like, like four times as much. <laughs> you get four times as much. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, but but you know you bring up actually a really good point about the stress test is they don't just test that quantitative element like how much capital, but they also test that qualitative element, and that's really where the banks, most banks that have gotten into trouble in the past, it really isn't that quantitative element that just asks the question, you know, like are these banks, you know, capital and risk models sophisticated enough in this day and age to determine what would happen uh, in, ty- in, in in that type of economic scenario? Yeah. So, um, and good job for the Fed for making it that way. Uh, so, so, just back to bank earnings. Um, we hit uh, some of the main things about about stuff that drives bank earnings. So, loan growth, uh, interest rates, um, uh, and so I think what we need. And we talked a little bit about what was going on in the world financially that could affect it. So, why don't we talk a little bit about capital markets? Because a lot of these big universal banks are seen as market makers. Right. So if you if you look at these universal banks, there, there's two components of them. There's your 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 depository and lending side of their operations, which is what you know your your typical person thinks about when they think about think about a bank. But then there's also that that Wall Street side of the business. So that's you know taking companies public, that's issuing bonds for companies, uh, that's acting as market makers in the trading markets, and those are known as capital markets businesses. And what we saw in the first quarter was that. Because of all the volatility uh, in the markets caused by you know the, what we you know the European stuff the, the you know the concerns about China the concerns in, in the energy market volatility in the capital markets is really high and when volatility is really high in the capital markets clients of these banks that you know need to trade securities um, step back from the market because there's just no reason to get in there when prices are going all over the place and when they step back from from the from the capital markets. You know these banks that act as market makers earn less in commissions. Well, that that you know that drove down trade sales and trading revenue by double digits in the first quarter, and there was a concern that that would be the same situation in the second quarter. But it's actually the exact opposite. Almost all the banks reported double digit year over year increases in their capital markets businesses, which which was you know in addition to that loan growth really helped them uh, in terms of trying to beat uh, analyst expectations. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um... I think that we just about covered everything. Oh, the only other thing that we we haven't covered, I guess, is um, energy. The energy sector it's still kind of weak right now, and the banks that have large portfolios that rely on energy um, are still shoring up their reserves. But it doesn't seem like it's. I don't know. I don't think it'll go on forever. Yeah, when if all you have to do is just look at a, a, a chart of oil prices. So they they bottomed out below thirty dollars a barrel uh, in the first quarter, but they've since re- improved. And I can't, I don't know exactly where they're at today, but on Friday they were at forty four, forty bucks, forty five bucks a barrel. And so a lot of banks had been modeling when they were setting setting aside their loan loss reserves for thirty dollars a barrel oil. So that's what they're modeling for in the first quarter. Well, now that the, the, the you know oil is way above that, it's still significantly you know half as much as it was. You know, a couple of years ago, but the, the fact that it's above that thirty dollars a barrel benchmark means that it's heading in the right direction for banks. Um, but you can still, I think, it's still fair to expect higher losses from banks in their energy portfolios, particularly this year, because the way that these their energy customers work is that they hedge their portfolio, their, they hedge their own positions, of, you know, in the oil and gas markets. But you can only hedge for you know out two years. And so even the maximum hedge starting in 2014, which is when oil prices declined, extends into this year. So it's really this is really where the rubber is going to meet the road um, in terms of the oil market for uh, the, the the oil market's impact on banks. And just in case any of our listeners are wondering, um, right now Monday, July 25th at 12:58 p.m. Um, Eastern Time, st- uh, the price of a barrel of crude oil is $44.21 USD. 
So. So there you go. So, so better go. better than thirty. Better than thirty, which is what they were originally modeling for. Um, so overall, it's a good quarter. It's not the best quarter of all time, but you know, they they had a quarter. They they had a quarter. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't like anything huge to write home about, either for good reasons or for the bad reasons. Yeah, and one of the things that I think we always say on these earnings shows, I don't know how people haven't gotten sick of us yet just repeating ourselves, um, is that it's a short-term thing looking at quarterly earning, earnings. Like, yes, they're important to look at. Like, if something like super drastic happens, it's a good time to reevaluate your thesis and evaluate your portfolio. But like, if you're a long-term holder of a stock, then it's eh, there's not much to worry about right now. <laughs> Yeah, not much to worry about. And really the value, what I have found in terms of analyzing quarterly earnings and in terms of being an investor in banks and other companies is where I really get value is you know each of these companies when they report earnings holds a conference call after they report earnings to, to kind of walk investors and analysts through their, their, their performance in a quarter and also answer analyst questions. And where I really see value from an investor's perspective is listening to what the CEO, the CFO say in that call Listen, trying to get a sense for what analysts are asking and get a sense for how the executives are responding to those analyst questions. That, that really is wh- where I find the value in terms of quarterly earnings. Yeah, quarterly earnings are just, it's just for me an overall good time to have a check in, just see what's going on. But it's never really a time to panic unless someone says, like, oh, JK, I actually cheated on all my federal stress <laughs> tests and I don't have any money. Like, until that happens. Quarterly earnings are never a time of huge stress for me. Um, if you guys have any questions, definitely write in. Um, we would love to do another mailbag episode soon. So, the more questions, the better. Otherwise, we're going to make up questions and they're going to sound like Austin M from Alexandria, Virginia would like to know what banks are. Austin Morgan is our fabulous producer, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> So, as usual, oh, John, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure as always, Gabby. Fantastic. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Um, as usual, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Contact us at industryfocusatfool.com or by tweeting us at MFIndustryFocus. And thank you to Austin Morgan slash Austin M today's totally awesome producer and thank you to y'all for joining us everyone have a great week